Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our first ever Melcher Society Invitational Lecture for the Director's Circle. Um, we're so glad to have all of you Melcher Society members and Director's Circle members. Um, I'm Ben Simons, I'm the Director of Telfair Museums and it's a delight to see you all here tonight. I will not be long-winded as we have a number of other uh, people who will be introducing our esteemed speaker tonight. Um, my only message is simply that I would like you all to very seriously consider joining the Melcher Society because it supports one of the core functions of the museum, which is museum acquisitions. And we need to expand our resources for acquisitions so that our resources match our ambitions. <laughs> Please help us to achieve that goal. And with that, I will turn it over to Linda McWhorter, who is our chair of the Melcher Society. Thank you. Thanks, Ben, um, and welcome, everybody. I have written down my few words because I was told to be brief, and I don't tend to normally be brief. So I'm working on it. I'm working on it. And I'm so happy that Ben said that what he said about Melchers because acquisitions is our goal and our aim always. Um, as you see, images are going by of things that we have bought in the past. And when I look at it, it is so rewarding. I love this, this piece. And to be there when we purchase it, I cannot tell you that every time I see a piece that we have purchased, it reminds me of that night, and I'm excited again that we can contribute to the permanent collection, which is basically like our home and our, I better stick to my script, right, Ben? I can see Ben's looking at me. Okay, um, as I said, acquisitions is our mission. So in addition to our annual meeting where we select the art, it is recommended to us by the curatorial staff who work all year coming up with ideas that they think would work and pieces that they think we can afford, for one. Um, but we also gather to look at private collections and visit homes of collectors. And then we meet with collectors who may have contributed, say, uh, a work to a piece that is in an exhibition that we have here. So I encourage you all to join us. We work with the curatorial staff and, of course, with Ben, and especially with our uh, staff liaison, Alexan Alex Mann. Um, I was going to give you his full name, which I absolutely love. It's Crawford Alexander Mann, and I think it's the second or third or fourth or fifth or something. <laughs> anyway, um, and Al we work with Alex and... Uh, he is here tonight to introduce our speaker, though I don't see him. Oh, <laughs> I'm looking over here and he's right here. Anyway, Alex, come ahead. We're so happy that you're here. Linda, thank you so much. Um, it is really my privilege to be Linda's partner in crime in uh, all of the adventures of the Melcher Society and to welcome you all tonight um, for this lecture, which I have been looking forward to for many months. Um, but before I introduce our speaker, I also am going to make my uh, quick plug for the importance of the Melcher Society to the function of Telfair Museums. And it has been my privilege in the past to work with other museums that have a similar opportunities and similar groups supporting the collection and have seen that work and I want to make sure that that can continue and that this can be fun and that you all can be a part of that here. Uh, I'm going to, my slides seem to want to keep advancing ahead of me so I'm going to keep a watch on those um, as we go forward. Um, but in any case, I want to call your attention to two events coming up if you're in the Melcher Society on Tuesday, February uh, 18th, or sorry, um, April 18th is our next collection visit and mark your calendars for May 4th for the annual meeting and the art selection. So before I start, um, I owe an apology to Carl Brandt. 
in advertising this lecture, I criticized Mr. Brandt for collecting great things for Telfair, like the black prints that you see here um, that's over on view in the rotunda of the Academy, and not collecting more artwork by his contemporaries, by artists like Frederick Church, who we're going to be learning about tonight, because he could have been. Uh, this is a slide showing uh, the Corcoran collection, uh, formerly in DC, and there is Mr. Church and his masterpiece, Niagara, which was before Mr. Brandt moved to Savannah in the 1880s to become the founding director and the first curator of our museum. So he was the first person out there buying artwork for us. And I was kind of like, why didn't he get out there and collect the work of these folks that he knew so that we could have these things? Things that Mr. Brandt would have seen in progress in Church's studio. So while they were next door neighbors, this is when Frederick Church was painting Cotopaxi, now a centerpiece of the collection at the Detroit Institute of Arts. Uh, Aurora Borealis uh, was in Church's studio in 1865. Brandt would have seen this, now at the Smithsonian American Art Museum or rainy season in the tropics, 1866. So once again, Brandt got to watch this being made uh, long before it went to the of San Francisco. And uh, finally, this painting, Niagara Falls from the American side, which Church finished in 1867, that was previously in the collection of Alexander T. Stewart in New York City. Uh, Mr. Stewart was the third richest man in America by some accounts uh, during his time. He was a early department store millionaire and amassed a huge and fantastic collection of art, including works by Church and many other contemporary American and European painters. Here you're seeing a photograph of his collection as it was installed in the mansion that you see here which was in New York City at 34th Street and 5th Avenue. That address may be familiar to some of you all. When this was torn down, that's where the Empire State Building was built. So not a bad place to have your house. When Mr. Stewart passed away, the sale of his massive art collection was a huge social event, as you can see here, reported in uh, the Boston Globe. All of the most important collectors and society members attended, including, oh my, Carl Brandt of the Telfair Institute of Savannah, Georgia, was there on March 23rd, uh, 1880, uh, 1887, I believe, was the date of this. So one year after the opening of our museum, Brandt was in the audience watching the bidding happening on that Niagara painting that you just saw. And guess what we learned from the Boston Globe? Bear with me, I'm gonna read this to you. Considerable interest was shown when the last piece of the evening was put up, Niagara Falls from the American side by Frederick E. Church. Carl Brandt of Savannah, Georgia, was anxious to buy the picture, and banker J.S. Kennedy was his rival. Brandt started it at 2,500, and bidding was brisk to 7,000 when Brandt dropped out, remarking, there's no use bucking against a millionaire. And Kennedy took the picture, for $7,050. This was written up in many newspaper accounts, including the New York Times, which tells the exact same story and concludes by saying, the gentleman who failed to go $50 better <laughs> was Carl Brandt, director of the Telfair Institute, Savannah. So this is what people were reading about Savannah in the New York Times in 1887. We failed to go $50 better. You all know what I'm thinking. So the collector who bought this painting, Mr. Kennedy, promptly donated it to the Scottish National Gallery in Edinburgh, where it has hung ever since. Uh, and Will, our speaker tonight, tells me it is actually, uh, in square inches, Frederick Church's largest painting. I don't know how high bidding would have gone, but um, this could be a story where we applaud Brandt and Telfair for its ambition, or we scold him for uh, not 
pushing things a little bit further. I'll leave you all to uh, ponder, but instead of hanging in our rotunda next door in the academy, it is in the rotunda, actually a quite similar grand space in the Scottish National Gallery. Um, so that is uh, my little story in preparation, uh, encouraging you all to join the Melcher Society and be a part of some art collecting that's coming up on May 4th. Uh, but I want to close with one more connection between uh, church and uh, Brandt, and this is an article from the Savannah Morning News, and this is from a decade and a half later, 1890, and I'll read this one to you as well. Frederick E. Church, the celebrated painter, has been stopping at the DeSoto for several days with his family, left yesterday for Augusta, where he will remain for some time at the Sand Hills for the benefit of Mrs. Church's health. While he was in Savannah, he visited the Telfair Academy, Mr. Church and Mr. Brandt are old friends in their studios adjoined in New York. Mr. Church was more than surprised what, to find so fine a collection of art in Savannah, and the author of the famous Falls of Niagara paid high compliments to Mr. Brandt upon the great work he has accomplished as director of the Academy. Mr. Church has just returned from Mexico, and after staying a while in the Sand Hills, he will return with his wife and daughter, who is also traveling with him to their home on the Hudson. So that is my segue into our talk tonight, uh, which is about Mr. Church's home on the Hudson, and we are very pleased and privileged to have with us as our speaker this evening, uh, Dr. William Coleman. Uh, Dr. Coleman served from 2019 to 2022 as Director of Collections and Exhibitions at the Alana Partnership, overseeing exhibitions, research, and collections care for Olana, Frederick Church's 250-acre designed landscape and museum in New York's Hudson Valley, which is a National Historic Landmark. Prior to that, he was Associate Curator of American Art at the Newark Museum from 2017 to 2019 after holding fellowships at the Library Company of Philadelphia, Winterthur Museum and Library, Washington University in St. Louis, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and the Philadelphia Museum of Art, as well as internships at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, among many other projects. He holds a PhD in the history of art from the University of California, Berkeley, master's degrees from Oxford and the Courtauld, and a bachelor's from Haverford College. Dr. Coleman has produced numerous exhibitions, essays, and articles, uh, and won awards on topics ranging from Rubens to Thomas Cole, uh, Frederick Church, George O'Keefe, and connections between art and the environment. In October of 2022, just as we were inviting him to Savannah for this event, he left Alana for a new role, and he now serves as the Wyeth Foundation Curator and Director of the Andrew and Betsy Wyeth Study Center at the Brandywine Museum of Art outside Philadelphia, with additional oversight of Wyeth Foundation initiatives at the Farnsworth Art Museum in Maine. He is very well known and respected in the American art community, and it is an honor to welcome Dr. Coleman to Telfair as our speaker tonight for his lecture, Frederick Church Collector. Thank you very much, Alex, for that kind introduction. It's been such a treat to get to know your institution and your city today. Um, maybe you're a little too hard on, on poor Carl there when uh, we learn what a savvy businessman Frederick Edwin Church was and just how expensive his pictures were in his own lifetime. So Carl had every reason to believe that picture was going to go to five figures in the 19th century as so many of the works of this titan of the American art world did. And this place is a key part of that, this brand, this globe-striding persona um, making a global environment in the mid-Hudson Valley two hours north of New York City, one hour south of Olana. Um, as Church himself once said, um, this is the center of the world and I own it. And he created this global environment. Um, so we think about this person as the painter of Cotopaxi and Niagara and all these other objects. I'll show you a fair number of his paintings. We don't so often talk about him as a collector. And this was a consciously formed 
collection. Um, so it seemed an appropriate topic. I'm, I'm glad Alex had this inspiration. It's a real honor to speak to uh, another institution that was driven by artists as collectors. Uh, Carl Brandt, G um, G uh, Gabby Melchers, um, Gary Melchers, sorry. Um, these, these fascinating case studies of the, the eye of a maker um, dictating what kinds of objects will, will serve an institution like this one. So we're talking about the very same period when, when Mary Telfair's bequest launches this great and inspiring story that I've, I've so enjoyed getting to know. Um, 1872 is, is one of the key dates for Olana, 75, uh, the Telfair bequest as I understand it. Um, so I hope you, you might take some um, inspiration for your society from this, uh, this kindred case study here. Um, so this is, just for the broad strokes, a, as uh, Alex mentioned, a National Historic Landmark. It is a New York State Park. It is managed by a public-private partnership. Um, I was employed, until, employed very recently by the uh, pub, uh, private side of that partnership. The Olana Partnership is the, the feisty uh, nonprofit that runs curatorial education, um, all the kind of external facing parts of this um, remarkable and complex place, whereas New York State Parks, the, the government handles um, facilities upkeep, plowing the roads, those things. It fits together uh, pretty nicely, but it's a complicated place. Um, you'll get a sense of that today. Um, it requires a lot of care and feeding, and I hope that um, you'll get a chance to visit it for yourselves. Among the superlatives here, um, of which you'll get just a glimpse in my roughly 40 minutes with times for, time for questions at the end, are more than a thousand paintings, drawings, and prints by Frederick Edwin Church, certainly, but also others. And, and that's a really interesting story. What did Church, with the resources to build a place like this, on the proceeds of painting sales, choose to bring into his home in partnership with this other key creative force we'll hear a bit about, his wife, um, Isabel Carnes Church. Uh, another secret within this collection I won't have much time to talk about, a story for another day, a story for the exhibition I've curated for Olana next summer, um, Terraforming, Olana's historic photography collection on Earth, more than 7,000 19th century photographs, an amazing treasure trove, one of the major collections of that medium in this country, and nobody knows about it. So there are so many surprises here. Um, what it's maybe best known for are these global collections, a fascination with an imagined Middle East, Persian ceramics, um, uh, ta tapestries, textiles, all manner of objects from places he experienced in person and places he came to understand only through books and his imagination, making a house he called Persian adapted to the requirements of modern life. And this is problematic in the 21st century as if to be Persian is fundamentally historical. So we at Olana work to, to, to think about that, to think about his assumptions about these places, to bring in contemporary Persian artists who I was really delighted to find have been tremendously inspired by this place. Um, call it home. Uh, a professor at Union College of Persian, Persian descent told me how moving this place had been to him far from his own home, coming back to Olana and feeling this little taste of uh, affection for, for his homeland. So it's a complicated place, but it's one that is, is really deserving of our time, as I hope you'll conclude uh, today. So this all is Olana, not just that house on my title slide, 250 acres of designed landscape. It is an earthwork. It is a work of land art. It is an extensive work of, as that exhibition has it, terraforming, shaping this landscape um, to create certain moods and messages that we can read as we navigate it. All these little black lines snaking through it are specifically carriage roads, not modern driving roads, not hiking trails. These are roads you're meant to be driven along in a donkey cart, actually, to experience the landscape in motion, gradually revealing framed views as you move through it. Um, and this is one of the behind the scenes priorities of the place to reorient attention to the landscape, to um, help people to understand it as one overarching design, not just a house. We'll get to the house, the house is important, um, but all of this is part of the design. The lake, 
man made this business sense that made his paintings so darn unaffordable for poor Carl Brandt included in making that lake not merely creating a, a place of visual interest, but creating a useful source of refrigeration technology, this is his ice pond, and also selling the muck that was dug out of that lake as fertilizer to local farmers. So it more than pays for itself. It creates visual interest in the, in the, the middle distance for a painterly view, um, and it creates this kind of um, pleasing mood as you enter the place. You get the reflection of the house in the water and, and slowly move in toward the house that is the the beating heart of it all. There uh, we have one of Frederick Church's architectural drawings for the main house at Olana um, before the addition of the studio wing that makes the house as built a little different than what you see on the left and just a few tantalizing glimpses of these ornate patterns and textures, these tiles, all these materials um, brought in both from abroad and from local merchants in New York City. So um, this is the product of a global economy already by the latter half of the 19th century. Um, a, a quintessential work of what architectural historians call American eclecticism, this kind of architectural style um, that consisted of trying to make American buildings by bringing together the best ideas of the rest of the world as a whole, as a composite. Um, so it is a strange place. It is a mysterious and romantic and evocative place, but there is a context for it. It does come out of a fascinating moment in American history that has really interested me as a student of artists moving from landscape painting to three dimensions, shaping the environments around them. And he is one of an international pattern uh, of that phenomenon. Let me show you these people we're talking about. We've already gotten a glimpse of, of Fred himself as those who know him call him on the left. And let me show you and say a little bit about Isabel who is frustratingly little documented and she will not be the primary focus of my remarks. But we are learning more and more about this fascinating person. Um, there is one um, crucial letter from her daughter to a would-be biographer of Frederick Church saying, I paraphrase, I think you underestimate my mother. She was a really key force in the design of Olana. What we're coming to understand specifically is that she was choosing the colors of its interiors, which you'll see is a really important place, part of how the place reads. And even that she was making some of these complex room filling assemblages of objects, these um, uh, composites, um, uh, combinations of unexpected cultures in single rooms and single views. Um, so we, we understand that she's an important part of this story too, as she simply must have been, how must it have felt to have this um, incredibly internationally famous and successful artist as your partner um, bringing together this rather unconventional family home. We are learning she shaped it to be a comfortable family home and to function um, for her family, um, even as it was also a, a transmission of messages to the art market. It was a, uh, a part of this incredibly successful artistic career. So you've seen some of the paintings elsewhere. I promised to talk about Frederick Church Collector. So let me start to show you what's in this collection. So these are maybe two favorites from the painting collection of Olana. These hang on the walls of that house. Um, it does happily have modern climate control. It does um, complex loan exhibitions now. It does not have beautiful spaces like, like the building um, we're enjoying right now, but it does the best it can with this, this 19th century uh, building around it. Um, and these are the sort of rewards here. El Cosne Petra at left and the afterglow um, at right. Jamaica and Jordan, um, traces of this global career of a painter who made a, an explicit brand of being the global member of this moment that has been called the landscape boom. We sometimes hear about the Hudson River School. I, I like that idea of a boom because it conveys um, the huge sums being expended on paintings like this one, um, the, the fashion that, that drove that, and implicitly the bust that came after. And he was perfectly timed for that moment. Thomas Cole, his teacher, a little bit too early and was always in poverty, never gets to build his dream house. Um, Jasper Francis Cropsey dies in bankruptcy, doesn't get to keep his dream house. Church, just successful enough to enjoy this period from the 1850s to the 1870s when there was a rapacious demand for what he was selling um, and then he could enjoy the proceeds of those sales even as he started to go out of fashion uh, until his death in 1900 and turned his attentions uh, to a laser focus on Olana as his major artwork. Olana was also a laboratory of art making, so more of the painting collection here. Um, these are some views from Olana. 
um, top left view of the Catskills from the artist's home, the only one of these that was um, sold and later purchased back by the family because it was so important to the artist. Um, but then there are these secrets of the collection, all these intimate little personal studies capturing fleeting atmospheric effects using that remarkable structure as a kind of observatory. And we who work in that structure have known how it really does make you attuned to the changing seasons, the weather. You see the storms rolling in across the Catskills just across the river. Um, it is a viewing instrument, and I hope you'll keep that in mind as I start to take you through the rooms of this house. Think about how it's um, shaping your vision, um, controlling what you can and cannot see, um, and interacting with the representations of landscape that hang on the walls inside this house. Of course, it's especially interesting when the house serves as a subject in landscape painting, and there are just a couple of uh, fascinating case studies where he makes these portraits of his own home, um, especially interesting example there. Um, the paintings collection is not just about the work of Frederick Church, as I've alluded, and this is a, a favorite room and an unusual room in the house. Our tours often ended here, and when there wasn't enough staffing to have every room in the house open, this would be the first one to get cut. And so I spent my time at Alana urging people to take this room seriously. You, a captive audience, have to start here with me. We'll do my personal tour of Olana. I think this room is really important. The dining room, fascinatingly, is described in one of his early architectural plans for Olana as the picture gallery. And I think of this as a prehistory of Olana as museum, a little um, smoking gun that suggests that he was thinking of it as a public resource, a place that was uh, available to a wider visiting public, as indeed we know it was. Um, there, it was a, a place that with a, the right kind of letter of introduction, one could come and visit. He, he had a, a certain level of access to the public to see his pictures. There was, fascinatingly, an open grounds policy, so it was behaving as a park even before it quite literally became a New York State park. Um, and this room, that picture gallery, is full of European paintings, what he referred to as his old masters. Um, I was fascinated to see a resonance with the Telfair collection uh, today. Um, I, I saw on your walls a, a work uh, formerly attributed to Salvatore Rosa, one of these names of art history that was formerly up there in lights, a hugely influential force in the art world um, that so many artists like Church admired, who has uh, come to be a little uh, more obscure these days. But um, in this space, you can see a number of works that Church acquired specifically because he, he believed they were by Salvatore Rosa. Those are um, here and here. And there's another just behind the photographer in this shot. Um, so there's that fascination with Rosa that relates it to the Telfair. Amazing stories here. This is um, a, a fascinating image after a lost um, original, formerly from the Spanish original, uh, Spanish royal collection um, of the first Latin American saint, Saint Rose of Lima, an appropriate object for a painter who spent a lot of time in uh, South America. Amazing discoveries there. You'll see one of the um, pianos in the collection. There was a rich musical life to this place. Another topic for another day. But I want to quickly let you lay eyes on as much of this place as possible, and I will go where your questions lead um, in the, uh, the Q&A period at the end. Where our tours usually begin, and where a public visitor in the 19th century would have usually been received, is this is this space, the East Parlor. Um, so as we know, maybe some of the, the grand old houses of Savannah would have had a similarly public receiving room, a parlor, the most formal initial entry point to the house. Um, and this is that space. In contrast to the dining room, AKA picture gallery, where you have these high clerestory windows not allowing you uh, an eye level view of the landscape outside. Here you have a glimpse of house as viewing instrument. And I want you to note the comp comparison between the dimensions of these central rectangular frames of the windows to these oil studies that surround the tops of many of these rooms. He is quite literally framing the view as he did his own smaller works in oil on canvas um, and encouraging you to reflect on that view downriver. We're looking south in the direction of New York City there um, at this widening in the river that feels almost like a lake. Um, in the 19th century, you would have seen a continuous parade of steam and sail um, out the window there. Um, in the 20th century, you occasionally get the rare uh, ocean-going freighter that lets you imagine that, that vital artery of the continent, how it must have been in the 19th century. What we also see here is uh, another important case study. When we think about church working with Isabel as a collector, 
as a collector with inspiration to share uh, with your society, one key intermediary for this collecting practice is Lockwood de Forest. Lockwood de Forest acted as a, a kind of informal consultant or interior designer to Frederick Church, and we see that already here in these white cashmere chairs that we know came via Lockwood de Forest and in a fireplace I'll show you in the next image. So this is on the right side of the same photograph, the East Parlor fireplace with this ornate carved Burmese teak um, that came from this workshop that Lockwood de Forest operated in Ahmedabad, India um, with a, uh, a local maker named uh, Mugunbai Huthi Singh um, who was an English speaking um, car wood carver of Jain uh, faith he worked to preserve this uh, craft tradition of wood carving in Ahmedabad that he saw as threatened and then served as an intermediary to American buyers. So you'll see materials like this all throughout this house and very often when you see um, Indian art in this house and um, some other works of Syrian art in the collection, we know that they were coming via Lockwood de Forest. He was placing these objects in American collections Church was not only his um, great uncle, even though they were only about 24 years apart in age, he was also his painting teacher. So what I'm showing you at left and right are paintings by Lockwood de Forest, um, the, the right one from his period of study at Olana. Um, so de Forest is acting as a kind of Carl Brandt or um, Gary Melcher's advising church, encouraging the house in this direction of what we call Orientalism, this fascination with the Middle East and helping him to obtain objects that were not that common on the American market. Interestingly, that path of inspiration goes both ways, and we know that de Forest was very specifically inspired by the library at Olana. Um, he says um, in his own words, I was a great deal with Mr. Church for nearly 10 years. I stayed with him painting in the studio and going over his plans for the house while he was building and studying all the books on Persian and Oriental architecture in the evenings. So De Forest, who becomes a, a really important name in art history in his own right, takes his own professional path from this place. He is inspired to go to India and to form this remarkable business, the Ahmedabad Wood Carving Company, to set up his New York gallery where you could place orders for this carved Burmese teak by the foot, have it custom made to your specifications in Ahmedabad, shipped back, pa practically flat packed, practically like an Ikea method, numbered to be reassembled on site. I'll show you an example of that in my next slide. Um, but uh, keep this name in mind as we go through the rooms of this house. When you see that ornate carved woodwork, and very often when you see materials like these painted chairs, there is this other artist collector in the background. Next to the sitting room, I'm taking you through the house roughly as a visitor would. I think about this um, term from architectural history, the enfilade, uh, which is a notion of a kind of long corridor of progressive intimacy as you move farther and farther into the house. And we've gotten from most public East Parlor to more intimate here, the sitting room, as we've moved from east to west along the central axis of the house. This was Isabel's space, and this was an intimate family gathering space I, I think you see what I'm driving at here. This is another product of that Lockwood de Forest collecting practice. This is, as one has the privilege of doing when you work there, a, 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 an example of flat packing that I saw from pulling out the drawers and looking at the white chalk numbering that survives from the 19th century. The drawers are carefully numbered. The panels inside the desk are carefully numbered with this very fragile chalk from back then that showed you how to reassemble the desk once it arrived on site. And this was custom made, I don't know if you can tell, for the rather diminutive Mrs. Church. This is, she was only about four foot 10, four foot 11. So this is a, a tiny desk, only about that high um, to, to fit her comfortably with one of these grand stenciled windows here, um, these ornate little patterns, which are not stained glass, but rather cut black paper between panes of colored glass, uh, kind of a cost saving measure, but it does create a rather romantic effect. And you get a good look at that um, view down window, uh, down river there. More of these oil studies as you look around the rooms, these examples of the um, preparatory works, the uh, process studies that led to larger finished oils because this artist had no trouble selling his major finished exhibition works, the ones that remain in the collection do so for a good reason. They were a gift to Isabel. They were repurchased by the family. They were a mourning picture of deep personal significance. Um, so the collection is especially rich in these small works, but there are those few uh, potent masterpieces that we're, we're especially proud of um, that, that did survive in this family collection. 
at the center of the house is this remarkable space, the court hall. And as you look at these colors that give it meaning, think again of Isabel as we learn more and more that she was playing that key design role in choosing how these spaces would be rendered. Um, we understand that many of the patterns that you see here can be traced to specific buildings in the Middle East. That little um, latchwork motif is uh, from a specific church in Jerusalem. We can trace it very precisely. Many of the painted doors, we know their original source. Um, and then there are amazing pattern books in the collection. Another story here is the library, uh, an artist library from the 19th century, what was inspiring he and his family, even down to the level of his children's school books with their reverend doodles. It's all there. It's an amazing, intact uh, time capsule from the period. Um, there's a lot going on here, and I'm curious what will catch your eye. You can bring me back to anything that you're curious about um, when we get to the questions. I'll highlight um, just a couple of things here. One fascinating case study, I um, appreciate that Alex gave me this useful setup with um, Church's major um, masterpieces that he's well known for, and especially that 10th Street Studio Building context, this beating heart of the American art world, because there's a 10th Street Studio Building story right here with this blue morpho butterfly under glass. There's a, one of the favorite anecdotes about Frederick Church, which does seem to um, uh, to be accurate if we, if we really dig into it, I think it's a true story, is that he used this butterfly in his 10th Street Studio workspace as a memory aid for painting the colors of icebergs. He had the iridescent blue wings of a butterfly at his left while working on um, a large painting that was not in the slideshow, the icebergs now in the Dallas Museum of Art, um, and the subject of uh, the current exhibition I've curated at Olana, Chasing Icebergs, Art and a Disappearing Landscape, um, looking from that um, natural blue to the, the subtle and shifting colors he experienced uh, uh, encountering icebergs off the coast of Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, there are all kinds of unexpected stories here in a, a city with so much um, revolutionary history. I'll show you just a tiny little corner of an intriguing plate here, which is a uh, society of, of the Cincinnati plate from George Washington's personal service. Um, and this is uh, unexpected. We brought a tour group from Mount Vernon through Alana, and they stopped in their tracks instantly recognizing what this piece of ceramic must be. Uh, we have no good explanation of how it got there, and it's not the only one. We have one other um, from the same personal service, not just um, with the insignia of the Society of the Cincinnati, but specifically George Washington's own of that service. So, so many surprising surprises here in this consciously formed collection. Another fascinating um, moment here that brings in Lockwood de Forest is this irreverent object at left where we have um, that carved Burmese teak that is by now familiar to you coming from Ahmedabad, but set into it a Mexican Madonna. So these totally different traditions, a Jain shrine meeting the, the polychrome woodwork of Mexican Catholicism that was to Presbyterian Frederick Church nearly as exotic to his eye, uh, nearly as foreign. So there are these little playful um, glimpses throughout the house. Some of these curiosities and playful uses of other faith traditions are challenging for us in the 21st century, like a golden Buddha beneath the stairs. Uh, one group of that faith tradition refused to go to the second floor because they would not walk above the Buddha. Um, they did not have that meeting for, meaning for Frederick Church. He was um, fascinated and attracted uh, by its, um, its beauty. Uh, he was fascinated by the aesthetic world of Buddhism and, and I don't think meant to be disrespectful in placing it in that space, but, but so it goes. We have to wrestle with this in the 21st century. Our own um, collector's group has helped to fund reproducing historic carpets there. So those have just recently returned. Those carpets were long bare, but now we have these beautiful reproductions of the historic carpets in that space. Another recent acquisition uh, with um, even more modest acquisition funds than uh, the Telfair um, has been buying back this lovely little tile um, for a modest sum, but it's important to us. This is a, one of these works of Persian ceramic practice that was in the collection, had wandered off with heirs and descendants over the years and popped up in the market, so we were able to bring it home. Uh, another connection between our collections, Charles Loring Elliott is a name I've seen on your walls. These are both works by Charles Loring Elliott, uh, Portrait of Frederick Church at Left. I promise as I try to zoom you through a lot, I'm getting toward the end of my time, but I want to be led by you and hear what you'd like to hear more about. This is obviously an incredibly complex and rewarding place to go deep on. It contains many stories. Um, it is probably not to everyone's taste for a family home in the, the 21st century, but as a, a museum environment, as a chance to look back into the creative practices of the past, um, there's no place quite like it. 
the, the creative environment here is the studio. And this, you see the easel at the center, more easels stacked up at right, some of them very large to handle these monumental canvases he was working with, more Lockwood de Forest work around the sides, and then this um, Persian ceramic practice of one particular very famous maker named Ali Muhammad Isfahani there. Um, Pre-Columbian ceramics unexpectedly um, above the uh, um, Lockwood de Forest case there, and then more of the paintings collection as well, uh, an early biblical picture, um, Pilgrim in the Valley of the Shadow of Death, a really unusual Frederick Church. Um, you've got that big north window, steady light from the north that's characteristic of, of so many artist studios here. Now one uh, work in progress I wanted to share as I get toward the end of my time is what should be here. And this is something that I hope I got rolling before um, uh, taking this job that was uh, just too good to refuse my, my new role uh, with the Wyeth Foundation and the Brandywine Museum. But I, I think we are going to get this thing done at Olana. And this is um, the only scroll of its kind in a domestic context in this country. It's what's known as a Nehan Zoo, 14 foot long Buddhist scroll on silk depicting the death of the historical Buddha. It's an astonishing thing. This is the best photograph I have of it, but in the flesh, its colors are incredibly vivid and well-preserved, and it should be hanging right there, all the way down to the woodwork, that just that large, as my, my pointer is showing you. And as you can start to tell from this terrible photograph, it's in really dire condition. So it's been a, a multi-decade hope to get this thing conserved. I think we have the plan. I think we know how we're going to fund it, and I think it's going to get done by 2026, which in addition to certain other national anniversaries um, is the 200th anniversary of the birth of Frederick Church. So lots of good momentum for that year. I have transitioned from one artist-founded collection and landscape to another, and I'll give you just a peek at that. Andrew and Betsy Wyeth beside the mill, their property in Chad's Ford, and the remarkable design landscape Betsy James Wyeth created um, on, uh, in this case, Allen Island, Maine. Another story for another day, but a through line there um, in American art of these creators who, with the resources to um, build these environments to their heart's content, on the basis of the sale of paintings, made these really remarkable spaces that survive and now are open to the public and um, can help us to understand the creative process um, like few other places on the planet. Thank you.